Okay, here we are. We're live. Welcome, everybody. Welcome. Uh, we're just getting set up here. So I'm George. I'm with Epifan Video. Um, I'm in my house, obviously, like uh, most people here. But Matt, you're not in your house. Why don't you tell everybody where you are today? No, for the first time in, oh, months, anyways, three, almost almost a quarter of a year, I'm actually in our uh, production, our, our marketing studio that we usually do uh, live at Epifan, and I guess this is where eventually we'll be transitioning back to most of our webinar content as well. It's kind of nice to be back in the office, even if it's it looks nice. just for one day. Yeah, yeah, it looks nice. I miss our studio there, and our studio kind of ties in with some of the things that we've learned about how to build a studio, so it's, it's a bit relevant today that you're there. Yeah. Um, uh, we're, we're here waiting on Crowdcast. I'm looking, we've got a lot of people here uh, just getting ready to start up. And what we usually do at the beginning of these is just to give it, just give everybody a minute to join in. Uh, we started at two o'clock, it's 2.05 now. So uh, in a minute or two, we'll introduce our agenda and we'll go over everything that we're gonna talk about today. Cause I know uh, this is a popular topic right now, right Matt? Absolutely, yeah. And in the meantime, if you guys have questions, comments, things that you wanna throw at us, uh, there is a questions or a Q and A section that you can just throw all of your questions in there. If you do throw them in the general chat, there is a chance that we will miss them. Um, as well, also just keep an eye out for uh, any polls or contents. If we do have something we want to throw up, you'll get a nice little notification in the bottom there that you can uh, interact with. Mm -hmm. uh, we will be recording this. Uh, we will be posting this to our YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. uh, when this is done, we'll also have it on our website. So I know some of you like to go back and check some of the information we talked about here. Uh, go look on our website, you should find everything you need. Sometimes people ask for the slides too that we present. So if you want those, uh, just contact us on our support channels on our website and we can get you those. Yep, and if uh, you're a first time join, if this is the first time joining us for a webinar, uh, welcome to this uh, interesting and wonderful format. If you're curious to check out some of the other webinars we've done in the past, they're also all available on our YouTube webpage. That's right. Um, so we're kind of doing, in a microcosm, we're doing what some people might be doing with a, we call it a lecture recording studio. Mm. Um, uh, and we're going live here today, but some of the, a lot of the stuff that we're doing to set up this show here, we can talk about later today and how it might relate to what you're trying to achieve if you are setting up a lecture recording studio. Um, there's going to be some polls coming up shortly to ask you exactly what you're doing here today, and we'll try to cater our content around that. What do you think? So, Maybe we should get started? I think so. Okay. Uh, nice to see everybody here. Say hi in the chat. Let us know where you're from. Uh, it's always nice to see that. So why don't we get started about talking about building a lecture capture studio. So right now it's the hottest topic because of our current global conditions. Uh, many of you, most of you probably will have been spending the better part of three months at home now. Uh, if you're part of a faculty for an educational institution or a corporate network that needs to generate content to be available for either students, for a general customer basis, um, or just for other staff members, you're gonna wanna make sure that you have something more permanent and effective in place. So how would we go about doing that? Well, you'll need to have the ability to record a lot more studio. And as we're getting closer and closer towards the summer uh, and heading towards the, the latter half of the year, we don't really have any ideas what to expect yet for the, for the rest of the year. Um, if we're, everyone's going to get back into the offices or into their workplaces or into their schools in time. So we need to have contingency plans to provide the best possible result for your audience. Uh, and there's a few ways that you might want to set up a lecture capture studio. So uh, we've, I've been talking to a couple of schools who are not sure if it's going to be some kind of hybrid studio where it's part classroom, part recording studio. Mm -hmm where there's, there's a mix of students in class and a mix of remote students. That could be a scenario that we see come uh, to life. Or, uh, but we're gonna talk mostly today about just a dedicated studio. You want a quiet room, just a nice place to make high quality videos and, and interact with your students. So we'll walk through all the equipment that you're gonna need for that today. Right, so having a dedicated studio, such as something like I'm in today, um, first and foremost, you're gonna wanna make sure that it's easy or simple uh, and intuitive to use for, for recording purposes, either for lecture recordings or for general presentations. And if you're gonna make that easy and intuitive, you're also gonna wanna make sure that it's the best quality that you can get. So you're gonna be looking at high quality, high definition uh, for that video and audio to make sure to keep your audiences and, and students engaged in the content that you're trying to drive. 
So what do we need when we're building a more purpose-built or a more ultimate lecture recording studio? Well, you got to think about the space first and foremost. George, what are some things that we really need to consider when we're talking about the space? Well, uh, a lot of the things that I know about making a space, I learned, well, from two places. One is building this studio that we have in our auto office. Uh, a lot of us got together and talked. To, we've had many incarnations of different rooms in our office spaces as studios. It's true. And uh, maybe the first thing to do is find a quiet space, right? Right. So having control over your space means uh, knowing how much room you'll have to work with, understanding what sort of lighting conditions you'll have to start off with. Uh, and typically, you're going to want to avoid things like windows. The more control you have over your environment, the better your end result is going to be. Absolutely, yeah. Having control over that space and being able to mount things on the wall or on the ceilings, that kind of thing as well. If it's some kind of dual use space where it's part meeting room, part uh, recording space, usually you compromise on both of those sides. So uh, we're going to assume that you have access to a nice tidy room where you can do what you need to set up all your equipment. Right. So we're also going to talk about the actual equipment that you're going to have in the room. So we're going to cover things like cameras, such as that beautiful thing that's staring at me right now. Uh, we're also going to talk about audio gear, like some of the microphones that we're using in the room today. Uh, what are some other alternatives and possibilities? Or maybe you have multiple audio sources that you need to capture, so you might need to look at something like uh, an audio mixer. From there, we're also going to be talking about lighting. Right? We've got some. I've got some beautiful lighting here in the studio. Uh, what's the best way to set that up? What are some alternatives if you are a little bit short on what you have available? And then finally, how are you going to capture all of that? How is that going to be recorded? Awesome. Well, let's get started, Matt. Um, why don't we jump into the space? Let's talk about you know what kind of space we need, uh, we recommend right. for building a studio. So the biggest thing that we need to obviously consider first is the size of the space. Um, having enough space to be able to fit your camera, your lighting equipment, your audio gear uh, is going to be the primary driver of giving you a successful studio. Ideally, if you can make it a permanent solution or a, a single purpose built studio, uh, you're going to have a lot more flexibility into how you can achieve this. Another thing, and this was a challenge that we even had with this studio here when we started building it, is understanding the noise levels. So if you're uh, a room within a specific building, are the walls insulated? Are you able to hear people walking by or talking loudly in another space? Uh, are you able to control the vents that you have within the space? Are you hearing loud air conditioner units or the ventilation system that's pushing air maybe towards your audio equipment? And then honestly, just understanding what you want to put in the background. Some major key points that just you just need to consider just when conceptualizing the space. Now we understand that maybe you don't have an, a massive amount of space. Maybe you're going to be doing this as a permanent fixture or solution within your home. So. Being mindful of the amount of space that you have is going to be uh, the most practical. Now, if you're looking at the image below, uh, George, what do you think would, might be a challenge to deal with in that sort of space? Well, like you said, the reverberations of the, the, the sound on all of those bare walls. So I, I always like rooms with carpeting and curtains and whatever other soft surfaces in the room um, are always a big win for me. The, the natural light it's kind of a mixed blessing. Like I'm a photographer and, a, and I like to take video as well. And so I love natural light. I'm always excited about mm -hmm. it. But for if you're setting up a room for a teacher who doesn't really want to try to manipulate their camera settings every time the lighting changes, uh, that's going to be a problem. So if you can just have a completely controlled environment, shut off your windows, sorry, I have a room with no windows yeah. or, or black them out and then just set up lighting, then it's consistent all the time. And it, that's kind of what the goal for a, a, a well-functioning studio is consistency. So it's always exactly the same every time you go in and you don't have to worry about any variables. Right. Now, if you can't have a space without a window, um, obviously like blackout curtains, uh, you know, keeping them as close to the wall as possible so there's the least amount of, of natural light bleed into the room is probably the better solution. For sure. Uh, there's a new poll up, I'm being told. Ooh. So uh, if you're watching us on Crowdcast, well, I know you are. <laughs> uh, look, look at the bottom of your screen and it says polls. Uh, and this one's asking what your role is in your organization. Just lets us understand, you know, 
how do you fit in all of this uh, system? And then we'll make sure our cater our content cater our content towards you as we speak further today. Uh, we have a few other polls coming up throughout the uh, program, so uh, stay tuned. Yep. And again, if you guys have questions, please throw them into the question section along the bottom. Uh, throwing your questions into the comments, they can get lost. We do want to make sure that we're able to address those throughout. Um, if you see a particular question that you find very interesting, feel free to hit that upvote button so that it can get answered sooner. But yeah. Let's talk a little bit about. So, uh, what about the background? I mean, that's all. This one is a pickle. I mean, you, you mostly want clean, right? I'm going to guess in a lot of cases. That's that's a big win there if you can get it clean looking. Right. So avoiding avoiding the clutter, you don't want to have like your desk lamp and a bunch of different stacked books. And if you have items in your background, they need to have a purpose. They need to be able to to balance kind of the scene that you have. You want it to be interesting enough that people are appreciative of the content that's being seen within the frame, but not so much that it's distracting from the content that's being presented from the actual presenter. Yeah, and this is really an eye in the eye, in the eye of the beholder. I think it's it's challenging for a lot of people to set a really nice background, but um, a few simple tricks you might try is you can try a chroma key background. Mm -hmm in which case you put up a green screen behind you, you light it, and then you can replace it with a, an image of your school or uh, something relevant to your content. That's a pretty easy way to set up Electric Capture Studio, and we see that done quite a lot. Uh, or just uh, use some colored lights. So kind of like what we're seeing in your background right now, uh -huh. maybe we can't see the full extent of it because we're seeing a cropped view of you, and we have also some setback back there, but we've just set up some Philips Hue you know, the Philips Hue lights that do all the different colors. Right. There's a few of those back there and some other light strips that we use just to cast some colored light. I find that a really effective way to just make your talent jump off and they kind of look like they're in a professional studio environment as well. Right. And, and like in our case, we're, I'm, I'm very lucky that we're in a, a big studio that has a lot of space behind me and even ahead of me. But if you're in a room that is a, a lot more limited with space uh, and you have to put your back almost up against the wall, so to speak, uh, just having a very plain what simple one color background is an excellent way to go. And if you can put enough space between you and the wall, you could even put a colored light that's just offsetting some sort of some accent color along the wall. So that's also mm -hmm. an excellent way of doing it. So I noticed in the poll that most of the people who are watching here today are with the IT or who I, they identify as being part of the IT or technical team at their school. Um, so we'll try to make sure that we talk quite a bit about the IT side and all of the encoding technology, which is, of course, our specialty here. Yep. Um, so stay tuned. Uh, we'll get to that shortly. We're going to just run through a few of the other considerations you might want to talk about or think about when you're building a studio. All right. So why don't we talk about teaching props? So what are some kind of additional equipment that you might want to use to deliver you know, your content or your lecture within a specific studio space? Uh, well, I mean... The most commonly used one would be slides. Uh, you'll typically have your camera that's obviously facing your presenter, but you're going to want to make it dynamic enough that it keeps the interest of your audience. So this could be having uh, your slide presentation as a picture-in-picture, -picture, being able to switch between a camera source and your PowerPoint slide deck, um, or maybe something a little bit more dynamic. Uh, could be something like maybe a whiteboard that's in the background or off on a different wall, um, or even something like a, a light board or a what was the topic we were talking about, the, the smart board, something of that nature? Smart boards, yeah. smart boards, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one way or another, you're going to want to integrate these, whatever tool you use or your school uses or your teachers use, you're going to want to integrate it with your nice high-quality camera image as well. So we'll show you how that you can uh, make picture-in-picture -picture layouts so that your presentations are more dynamic and show both sides of it, or do switching, so you switch between the presentation and the, the camera image as well. Um, I know in this next photo that we're going to show here, Matt, there's a really nice example uh, from a school that we visited uh, earlier this year, right before COVID came. Um, we were in Belgium, uh -huh. and this is at Thomas More University, um, where Professor Pete is up at the front of the room here. You can see him standing in front of this camera setup, and they have really nice lighting. Uh, they built this studio just for capturing, uh, for doing video lectures. So... It's a really nice example. You can see they've got the, the ceiling mounted rigging. There's probably another word for that that I don't know, uh, where they can hang all their lights from and hang whatever else they needed so the floors are nice and clean. There's no cables on the floor as well, you'll find. Um, and the teacher can engage with this smart board. So, so 
Pete is, you know, drawing on this, this smart board at the same time. He's controlling all this presentation and then he can turn and look to the camera as needed. So it's very dynamic. Um, you'll also notice he's standing up, which I don't know about you, Matt, but when I feel most comfortable speaking when I'm standing up. So that might be something you want to consider too. Like how are your teachers going to want to present? Right. And I know we'll get into that a bit later too. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing to consider is we're looking at that, that rig there specifically where he's got the lights hanging. But maybe in your specific uh, lecture capture setup, you might need to consider something uh, for the sciences, maybe a biology dissection. So maybe hanging a camera from the ceiling straight down uh, over a specific table or a specific podium or something at the, uh, that can provide you an overhead view of precisely what's happening. So being able to change those specific angles will also create that extra level of interest and dynamic uh, flair to your presentation. Totally. Um, we have another poll, by the way, up in the Crowdcast. So take a look there. It's asking about, actually, let me pull it up so I can see myself. Perfect. What if I, I can even answer it, actually. I'm, I'm logged in as a different user here. Uh, <laughs> since the World Health Crisis began, is your school producing more or less recorded video? Um, so we have a couple of votes in already, people saying they're producing more recorded video, which is, I guess, pretty obvious. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I imagine a lot of people are thinking about the future here. So hopefully this webinar can help those of you. Right. And the advantages, of course, is we're talking about specific lecture capture, so recording in this case for the, the majority of the part. Um, recording does give you that little added benefit, of course, that you can do as many takes as you need to, to get that content right. And then if you have to go back and edit it after the fact, you can do that. So as we're pushing through all of this content here, just be mindful of this is going to be more on the recording side or a little bit more on, on live or a little bit of both and see kind of what suits you, the, the setup most commonly. For sure, for sure. So can we talk about kind of my favorite sections? We're getting it closer and closer to audio. <laughs> yeah, Matt is an audio engineer at heart. I am. Really uh, am. And so you're going to see his eyes light up in a, in a minute here when we get to the audio. <laughs> But I'm more of a camera guy. But you are the camera guy. So, so, so this is more of my bailiwick for sure. So what would you suggest would be kind of like the, the most ideal camera solutions for your lecture capture setup? Well, it really depends on your comfort level as a camera operator. Okay. And, and that, that could be your comfort level as the IT administer, administrator, or if you're actually asking your faculty to be a, faculty to be involved in operating that camera too. So I kind of look at it from a control point of view, like how much control do I want over these cameras? Because in this slide here, there's some cameras that are, you put them in a room. Like if you take, for example, a PTZ camera, uh -huh. so that's a pan tilt zoom camera, this little white one in the bottom of the slide. The reason those are so popular in lecture capture environments is because you put them in a room and they, they're very easy to operate and they can do nice things like tracking. So they can track your subject as they move around the room. And they have presets as well. So you can have just two presets, a close-up shot or a wide shot. So in, in a more classroom type situation where you have a, a bigger room and a bigger space, uh -huh. you'll see these cameras are everywhere. And I'm sure everybody who's watching here is familiar with this. Um, so I like those uh, as a, an easy to use option. And they're professionally made as well. So they tend to be built for people, built for lasting a long time without many people fussing with them. Right. Um, going out from there, if you're setting up maybe a home studio environment or something, uh, a camcorder might be uh, your next best option. Hang on a sec. I'm hearing crazy noise coming from the, the next room. Do you guys hear that? No, I don't. It's like uh, someone's uh, spray painting my house. I don't know. Um, we'll see if that carries on here. And I'm sorry about that. So anyway, yeah, camcorders. I like camcorders a lot too because they're super easy to operate. Right. Um, and then we get into the like mirrorless cameras and uh, cinema cameras as well, which are going to give you big, beautiful images, but require someone who kind of understands how to manipulate them a little bit more. Right. And something just to, to on the point of mirrorless or DSLR style cameras, uh, just to be mindful as you know, a member of the technical support team. We have a lot of people that ask us questions uh, about which cameras are the best suited for their specific environment. And a lot of people tend to come back and say, hey, for whatever reason, after about 30 minutes or so, my mirrorless or my DSLR camera just turns itself off. Uh, and that's just something to consider that there are cameras out there that will automatically power themselves down 
or put themselves into a standby state just to preserve a battery power and just to ensure that the camera doesn't overheat. So you just want to make sure that that camera is uh, well suited for the environment if it's going to be powered on or if you're going to be able to provide in content for an extended period of time. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't talk about USB cameras here and uh, I'm sure a lot of people are using USB cameras right now as well. Mm -hmm. and. They're a good option for when you're just getting set up. Um, they're fairly limited in terms of their image quality. So I guess that's why they're not on this list. Uh, we're thinking of people who want to build a studio that's maybe beyond what you can accomplish with uh, a USB camera and a laptop, uh, that kind of setup. Right. So that's why we haven't really talked about them today, but they're certainly easy to use. And for people just getting started, I would recommend them as well. And if you're going to be using a more purpose specific or perfect cho purpose chosen uh, camera source, you're going to want to consider things like how are you going to mount it. Um, you did mention before uh, mounting it to a ceiling or to a wall, similar to how the Thomas More School did. Uh, but even using something as simple as a tripod, have, making sure that you're having a strong, sturdy, stable tripod that's not going to collapse on you at any point in time is also a good thing to have. Mm -hmm, for sure. Um, and you might want a wide angle lens as well. Maybe not, not wide, like fisheye wide, but you need to as, a pair, as opposed to a lecture hall, when your camera's way at the back of the room, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of those cameras are not necessarily well suited for being in a small setting because the, the, the angle of the lens might not be wide enough. Right, because if the camera has to sit closer to you, you want to make sure that you're getting enough of that frame and you're not cutting off certain aspects, either the top of the head or side of the body as information. So making sure that you have the correct lens and the correct shot for that specific uh, studio is also very paramount. As well, consider the height mm -hmm. that you're placing the camera. So as an example, the camera that I have here in the studio is at about maybe just slightly higher than eye level. But ideally, that's pretty much where you're going to want to have your camera most of the time. Unless you're looking at an overhead camera or a document camera that's purpose-focused away from the presenter. Right, for sure. Another pesky problem I often see, um, especially with older cameras, older camcorders, older mirrorless and DSLR cameras is not having a clean HDMI output. So a clean HDMI output in a sense would be if you connect HDMI out to a television or to a, a hardware encoder, you're seeing all of the menu icons. You're seeing the start button, the, the settings, menus, and such. So uh, making sure that your camera does have a clean HDMI out is important. Uh, if you have the ability to test a camera uh, at a store or you know, to, to test ahead of time, connecting it to a television to see what sort of end result you're seeing is going to be very vital to the purpose or the, the correctly selected camera. Mm -hmm. And for the love of God, um, use power. <laughs> yeah, I've learned that one the hard way a number of times. Um, so yeah, constant power source yep. that is a lovely thing. And not all. And the thing is, when you buy a camera, you don't necessarily know if it if that's even available. There are cameras where it's hard to find a constant power supply. So before specking out that camera for your studio, make sure it there is one available that you can buy. Yeah, visit the the camera or the manufacturer's forums. You know, scour the internet if you can oh, to get as tip. many details as yeah. humanly possible. Because mm -hmm. most cameras, like, they don't always think about their sort of live streaming capabilities or how they interact with computers and such. They think of them as recording on that camera. Right. So the specs and all the marketing seems to be built for people who are just walking around, taking pictures, taking video, and sort of using it on that camera. Whereas we're always talking about how do we get that footage off of the camera? So um, Bypass that internal recording need altogether. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So then that brings us to your favorite subject, Matt. It is. Audio. It is the audio. So, so I mean, there's a number of different ways that you can capture audio, but if you're going to be putting yourself in a more professional or, or a more robust uh, lecture capture or recording studio, you're going to want to make sure that you have a high quality audio source. And so there are a number of different types of microphones out there. Uh, the most common ones that you'll see on the news or in most capture studios will just be little lapel microphones. Uh, typically they're wireless. They connect to like a, like a wireless battery pack that goes back to um, a mixer or to your encoder to capture that specific audio. But there's also other options um, such as a microphone that you might put on the desktop or even a room microphone. So in the studio here right now today, I'm using uh, what's called a shotgun mic. Uh, it's an NTG4 by Rode, and it's just kind of sitting very slightly outside of frame, about uh, three, four feet above my head. So there are some definitely some, some options that you want to consider as you're going through what type of microphone. 
Um, it's also important to note that the type of microphone that you're investing in will also give you more or less control over the, s the quality of your sound. If we take a step back to uh, when we were talking about the space that you're going to be using, uh, you want to ensure that you have as much control over it as possible. So this means no reflective surfaces. Uh, if it's a dual purpose studio, you might have less in the way of control over how a space sounds, but having control over the quality of the audio that you're getting, the probably at that point, the closer to the audio source you can get, the better. So having perhaps uh, a lapel microphone that sits on your collar or on the edge of your shirt would be more appropriate to give you a slightly better control, especially if there's a lot of reverberations or echoes within a room. Yeah, my favorite out of all of these is the wireless options. Yes. Uh, either the lapel style wireless mic or the headset one. And the headset ones are great because your microphone is right beside your mouth. And so it generally always sounds pretty good and usually they're designed well so they block out all the extra noise. So people come in the room or if you have what just happened here where I had somebody outside like spraying a hose or something like uh -huh. that, you won't, it won't bleed into your, your production quite as much. Whereas a room like, like this will, more often than not, they're not as directional uh, as a lab. Um, and so they're sometimes harder to control. Or if, you're, if your teacher or instructor moves away from those mics, they go off mic a little bit, uh, again, you have less control over it. So those wearables that you can get, those lav mics or the headsets, they're kind of a guarantee. However, you do run the risk that batteries will die on them. So you, they're, I mean, you could get a plugged in lav, lav mic as well, which works, but then you're kind of tethered to this to your seat a little bit or it's true. you might step on it and stuff like that. Yeah, so. if you can foster the, the you know, your own personal best habit to either have, you know, if this is a, a global studio that multiple content providers will come in and out, you can foster that behavior to either have them or have a member of your team that comes in and just plugs in the, uh, the battery powered equipment like the, you know, wireless lab microphone is an example at the end of every session. Um, it'll just prevent issues from occurring over time. And of course, having a chance to, you know, preferably get to check the equipment about a half an hour to an hour beforehand, we'll make sure that you're set up for success. But we certainly understand it's not always possible to do that. If you're, mm -hmm. and sorry, go ahead, George. And can I, just one other thing on that note. If, if anybody knows of a great solution for a mic, a rechargeable body pack, um, where I don't have to take the batteries out and charge it into some system, some little base station where I can just drop it in and charge it wireless or otherwise, that would be a, like a dream for a lecture capture studio. Yes. Uh, I've been scouring the internet looking for one and I found ones that do a really great job with the handheld microphones where you just drop it back in a little caddy, but right. the, the battery packs, they usually require a little bit of fiddling to, to get them to be charged. So uh, put that in the chat. That's a personal re request from me to the viewers of this, this program. Ask and you may receive. Um, I hope so. If you are curious about the headsets, if you've never seen them before, uh, they're the ones that are very commonly used on uh, independent or sponsored TED Talks. Um, it's the ones that just have the little wire mesh that goes around the ear uh, and the microphone that sits uh, about somewhere between ear and uh, mouth on mid cheek. So that's one of the examples that you'll see there. That's a good one, yeah. And it's a nice example because everybody looks nice and smart on a TED Talk. So, Yes. Maybe one day I'll give one of those. We'll see. I hope so. Uh, but sometimes, you know, you're going to have situations where maybe you're going to have multiple audio sources. Um, let's say, for example, you're at the School of Berkeley and you have to capture audio from multiple different audio sources. This could be instruments, this could be uh, a choir, or this could just be multiple speakers, maybe that are, are doing some sort of dialogue or, or debate uh, as part of a course content. You need to make sure that you have a way of being able to capture all of that together. And there's two major real categories here uh, and that'll really depend on the budget that you have the space that you have available to add all of this gear in um, and what sort of kind of like encoder you're using at the end of the day so the first one and the most common one that i have been using when i'm at my home personal studio um, is kind of an audio usb capture card so this is the type that you would connect to your computer or to a dedicated uh, system that you would just select as an audio source within an operating system like on Windows or Mac. So you can connect and, and different audio cards will have different number of inputs as well. There are some USB 
uh, capture cards out there that are rack mounted that will give you up to seven or eight inputs and then you have some that are even just very introductory that give you one or two inputs so also just being aware of what sort of uh, of the number of sources you might need will be very beneficial but mm -hmm. there are some limitations to using something like an audio capture card uh, an audio capture card will give the ability to capture uh, audio source directly into your computer but it won't give you options such as uh, being able to balance the volume of what they're of, of how they're coming in. So, uh, George, if you were talking significantly louder than myself, as an example, there was no way to be adjusting that without changing all of that input gain and providing a less stable or or a less high quality audio source. So this is where you might get a lot better control using something like a mixer, where you have the ability to adjust your gain adjust your levels and make sure everything sounds balanced and perfect. And they often offer things uh, like EQ, uh, different effects if you need to add some, uh, so let's say some, a little bit of reverb just to give some room presence if you're in a very quiet or a very dead room. And there are different versions. There are some that do output over USB. Um, I believe Behringer makes one uh, that does use software on a computer. Um, but more commonly, you'll get those that are just straight digital or analog boards that have XLR or quarter inch outputs that you can go into a dedicated hardware encoder or, or capture device. Mm -hmm. And it's possible you don't need either of these. You may either have, you may just have a simple USB setup where you have a USB mic going into your system. Um, and that's completely viable. Um, for a studio environment, like Matt said, you're might likely going to run into a situation where you have multiple inputs and then it's going to probably not be enough for you. Um, you may also have a hardware encoder like our one of our Pearl systems that uh, will you can connect directly to mic or uh, line level sources. So in those cases, you, you might be able to bypass a mixer, but uh, it seems like inevitably you kind of want some of the nice features that you get with a mixer. At least even in my home setup here, I was thinking the other day how oh I would not have it, mind having a mixer here because I wanted to have a second audio source and I also wanted to play with some mix minus stuff as well. So. Uh, they're pretty powerful tools, and they're not that expensive too, so it wouldn't be a huge part of your kit to add a mixer to it. Yep, but if uh, if you're running under the concept of less is more, uh, then having the ability to capture audio directly into a camera and then just using a digital uh, video with embedded audio source out um, will be probably the less the least cumbersome of solutions. So whether that's SDI or yep. HDMI is most standardly used. Right. So while we're still on audio here, I want to thank a couple of people here, uh, Chris Colvin and and Charles and Patrick have put in some comments about some nice solutions for uh, wireless uh, labs that they use. The, I see the Rode Wireless Go is being recommended. That's one I've been looking into yep. as well. And I'm glad to hear that works really well. And so thank you for these. We'll look into those as well. And we got one question earlier on, Matt, someone asking about using a smartphone uh, as a video source uh, for their lecture capture. You can. Um, there's a couple of different ways that you can do that. There's uh, applications out there that will digitally pass along that video signal or virtually pass on that video signal to be captured within software on a computer um, or to a specific device. So using, for example, a, an SRT output or an HLS output or an NDI output applications, there's a couple of things that you can use there. Um, but more commonly, what you'll typically use is either the output from, uh, let's say, an Android-based device or an Apple-based device that will go... Uh, adapter into HDMI, into a USB capture card, into your computer. That's the most mm -hmm. common way to use it. Um, but if you have the appropriate adapters, it doesn't necessarily have to go into a specific USB capture card. Oftentimes, you can also just connect it directly to um, a dedicated hardware encoder if you're using a, a more purpose-built all-in-one solution. Right. Keep, okay. keep in mind, though, you uh, might Marta's... want to stand for that. You know, like those little uh, kind of like spring-loaded arms that will kind of stabilize the image and, pre and prevent the camera from shifting around too much, that's usually the better way to go. Uh, obviously handheld is, or propped up against uh, an object isn't always the best because if it's a desk surface, it'll eventually slide and fall and face up. So just keep that in mind. We are getting told to, we should uh, keep things moving along here, Matt, because we've got a, a lot of things to get through and we're about 37 minutes in. Oh. So let's... Uh... Let's pick up our pace a little bit sure. and maybe jump into the next section, yeah. uh, which is kind of the, what do we call this section? Confidence monitoring section, all right? Yeah, so we'll talk about so, things that you want to be able to see your content, right? Making sure that what you're recording or what you're streaming is actually making it to where it wants to go. Are you seeing the layouts that you want to see? Mm -hmm. What if you have a script? Yeah. 
That's right. So you may want a teleprompter for your faculty. You, and, and if nothing else, you're, whoever's going to be on camera is going to want some kind of confidence monitor so that they can see, yep, that's me. I look okay. I can see that my slides are working just to give it a little bit of sense of confidence uh -huh. there. That's why it's called a confidence monitor after all. So uh, having some kind of monitor in your setup to show your talent what's going on. Um, but placing it is a bit of an art as well because as soon as you put a monitor up with someone's uh, image on it, just like I have in front of me, I'm going to want to look at it. Yep. So instead of looking here, I'm supposed to be looking at a camera, but it's really hard not to. <laughs> I know you specifically said before this show, don't put a monitor in the room because I'm just going to stare at it. Yeah. So having a monitor really close to your camera is, is a nice thing. Um, or, or somewhere discreet so they can look at it, take a peek at it as well. I don't know. It's tricky, isn't it? Yes. And uh, if you're not using, for example, I've got a laptop here to my side. So I'm able to do uh, changing of, of slide presentations directly from the laptop. But if you've got that laptop or a, a computer at the other end of the room, you'll also want something that will allow you to change those specific slides. So maybe a little remote or a little clicker of some sort to actually sure, change yeah, that over. Yeah. And if you are using audio... And these are behavioral things, right? Of course, yeah. And you'll want a way to be able to monitor your audio. Not actually hear it in the room, so you're doubling up on the audio, causing a feedback loop, but enough that you maybe see visual meters just happening saying, okay, great, I'm still getting audio which my audience could theoretically hear. So that's also important to have. That's right. And that's kind of one of the things that a lot of people like about our Pearl systems, right? Is that they have a, um, a touch screen. Matt, maybe you can just throw up that slide for a second when we talk about Pearl slide number 17. Because they have a touch screen on them, that touch screen, for a lot of people, it acts as their confidence monitor. So the teacher can go in the room and go, oh yeah, that's me. I can see the camera image and stuff. And I can see there's a little audio meter on it as well. Uh, I'm using a Pearl today in front of me, and so every now and again I look down at it just to make sure everything's okay. So uh, it can kind of act as your confidence monitor as well. Hmm. So let's talk about lighting. Sure. Uh, um, so we talked about natural light and trying to avoid it at all costs if you can, uh, mainly because there's a lot less control you have. A cloudy day versus a sunny day versus sunrise versus sunset, you're going to get different color temperatures, you're going to get different angles, you're going to get different responses and quality from your video sources uh, and your overall lighting sources that you have in the room. So if you can, make sure that you have your purpose-built studio and in those studios you're going to want to make sure that you have purposeful lights. So we kind of have a mix of everything in these studios. We've got our hue lights that we have in the corner here uh, and most commonly now we're using LED lights. So I've got blinding lights in front of me actually. Um, and I mean, they they work great. I mean, as far as I as far as I look, I think I look okay. I'm well lit, well presented. You look beautiful, Matt. Just beautiful. Perfect. So, <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's not too hard setting up light. A couple of lights set up in your room, and you're kind of on your way. You can have as much fun with this as you like. Uh, we often talk about just really going with some kind of three point lighting setup. Right. And so so a three point that lighting setup. Our, yeah, two lights in front of you. A fill light, a key light. Um, these are to make me look good. Yeah. And 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 sculpt it as well, so I have a bit of range to my face. Mm -hmm. And then having another another little light in the back uh, will give a kind of an edge light effect as well. So yeah. Uh, if you look up three point lighting setups and try them out and uh, look through your camera and take a look, and it should look pretty good for you. So. Yeah, I'd say experiment when it comes to lighting. Now, if you don't have room for three-point lighting, two-point lighting is just as good. Just get rid of the back, the background light and just try to give more interest or a little dynamic point for maybe your background instead. Yeah. Okay. Lighting, lights, camera, audio, recording. Yes. Yeah, so this is kind of where it gets interesting from our perspective, isn't it? Yeah, because, um, I mean, software, hardware... Which is the best solution yeah. for you? And that kind of so, comes back to what sort of studio you're, you're planning on using. Um, if you're looking for uh, like a high-end purpose-built studio, you're probably going to want to lean towards a dedicated hardware encoder. Uh, these guys are purpose-built exactly for that purpose. That's all they do. They tend to be significantly more reliable. Uh, they breathe by the concept. Typically, less is more in the sense that they make it easier for you to get from point A to your end viewer, um, which I guess would be point C or B. And uh, and then you have uh, solutions that are more inexpensive, possibly, but then can be more cumbersome at the end of the day because they're relying on a lot more, such as software encoders, because you've got 
capture cards, you've got the uh, computer itself, and then you have software updates, operating system updates, making sure that everything is running correctly and making sure that it's getting out to the network. So there's just a couple of little extra steps and trade-offs you have to consider. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of people that get started and they might try out a capture card setup. If you're a technical person and you feel like you want to get a better camera image and you want to just go take an improvement from basically doing a looking into your camera's laptop and or webcam and doing it that way, a lot of people will, will first go to a capture card and then they can bring in a nice looking camera and stuff like that. But then when it comes to if you're an IT person trying to deploy this across a, a campus, for many people to use, a capture card setup is generally a bit of a higher maintenance solution yes. where people have to understand what's coming in and what's going where and there's a couple of moving parts. And so ha the reason, one of the reasons we made Pearl was because we wanted to provide a solution where people could walk into a room, walk up and push literally one button on it. There's a big red button. It says start. Yeah. What does it say? Start, uh, it, start, anyway. Yeah, start and then stop if you're up and running. Start and stop. So it's very simple. Um, so if you're trying to design a lecture capture studio for other people to operate in who, you, who are not AV people at all, uh, having a purpose-built appliance is, is going to give you a lot more confidence and the people who go in there a lot more confidence in, in operating it. Um, it all comes back to, you know, if it's easy to use, you're going to want to use it more. Uh, it's also, if you're an IT professional watching this, it also means less work for you at the end of the day. You come in and install the device within the room. You can probably manage the device, do updates and changes remotely. If you have to do a physical change, such as lighting or camera setup, that's a little different. But being able to monitor, control, and get that professional quality to the end user, uh, such as a student or an audience member that's absorbing or, or you know, enjoying that content, uh, it's going to be much easier for you. And you can do it from the comfort of your desk or remotely if you're if you, using a VPN or, or a way of being able to log in remotely for the unit itself. That's right. And of course, a lot of people are going to understand, want to understand how these different kinds of systems might interact with their school's CMS um, and ultimately their LMS. Uh, so no matter what kind of system you have, that's probably the first place you want to look at. Like what is going to work well with my CMS uh, if I have that? Because if you can't get your files easily from your uh, encoder or your computers to your CMS, you're going to have a lot of pain there. So our Pearl systems uh, over the past year, I'm going to say, uh, we've integrated with Kaltura and Panopto yep. as a way to allow people to automatically just push the recordings up to their Pearl and Panopto um, systems and also use those systems to schedule those devices to start. Right. So it can be completely hands off. People just walk into a room and everything starts. They don't have to even have to push that one button. So um, consider that as well, how it's going to work with your CMS. Yep. So rather than just continue to plug the come to this the simple differences, we'll just look at a very simple comparison setup between what would uh, you would do with a software encoder versus a hardware encoder. So uh, let's start off with the software encoder, um, which is using a USB capture card and going into uh, a, like a computer. So what you see here is you have an audio source. So this is, could be a you know a desk microphone. Uh, this might be a USB microphone that's connected directly to the computer or going into an audio capture card, which is connected to uh, that specific computer. You've got a USB capture card. Maybe you've got multiple that you're connecting video sources to. And then maybe you've got a PowerPoint presentation that's either coming from a separate computer or that might be installed on that specific computer already. And the idea is that you'll do all of that recording or streaming within software on that device, and then it'll go over to your content delivery network. So this could be Kaltura or, or Panopto or uh, any other platform that you might have. And it, maybe if you don't have a content management system, you're using a learning management system to just upload recorded content uh, once completed. On the other hand... Yeah, and this is a, that, that is a great setup. I mean, I use that kind of setup uh, pretty often. But like I said earlier, I'm a technical person and I'm setting it up for me. I'm not setting it up for other people. Right. Um, so... Yeah, there's, there's a win on both of these sides, I would say. Yeah, and this is probably, honestly, the most common setup that we're going to see right now. Um, with Because of COVID-19, uh, people have been you know rushing to put together setups to get people online to be able to deliver that content. But as things mo move to a more per, uh, like you know permanent or digital era, you might look at just simply changing or upgrading that setup to that more purpose-built solution, which is where you start getting into the hardware encoder with 
less possible failure points or pain points that you'll see. So we can see here using our, our Perl as an example, you've got your multiple video sources that are directly connected to a purpose-built device. The audio is going directly to this purpose-built device and then recording locally uh, and either uploading or streaming also directly to that end destination. In this case, uh, like a CDN, a content delivery network, or you could even stream to multiple destinations simultaneously if you wanted to do something like to YouTube or Vimeo Live or Facebook Live or really a, or any other content delivery network that you can think of. Mm -hmm. So why don't we show some studios? Yeah. So this first one, this is a stock photo. I will tell you that up front, but it does nicely illustrate some of the concepts we're talking about here. Just a, a nice lighting setup, simple background, camera, person at a desk. Yep. So this is kind of what we imagine just to put your head where we're at when we think about setting up Electric Capture Studio. I'd love to know from you if this is what you were thinking of when you signed up for this uh, um, webinar today. Are you thinking of this kind of studio? Or are you thinking of a studio that is completely different? Please add those comments into the Crowdcast. Yep. Also ask any questions there because uh, we're going to be wrapping up the content part of this and we're going to turn it over to you guys and all of your questions. So. Uh, add them there and we'll make sure we take enough time to answer everybody's questions. Now, before we move on to the, the next example slide here, um, I just do want, do want to point out here that you're probably able to see it on the uh, that little stool that's beside the camera. But there's actually a little, looks like a Zoom recorder with a microphone or with a, a cable that actually runs all the way underneath the desk. And he's actually wearing a, a cable connected lapel microphone directly on his person. Um, also on the desk, you'll notice he's got a nice little plant. So he's strategically placing items to give his environment a little bit more personality, a little bit more excitement. And he is, of course, running, he's actually running a four point light system. He's got uh, two floods in front, and he's got the one above him, the top left, and then he's got the, the background lighting in the back. So a couple things to stare at. But let's look at an older photo, because obviously I'm in the studio right now, of our studio. That's right. So you're sitting behind this very desk right now. I am. Um, with that camera, that's a, a Z cam, yep. which is kind of like a cinema camera uh, pointed at you. And you can see our light placement. It's, it's very basic. It's a simple, empty room, but we did paint the walls nice and dark so that we have, again, nice control over our lighting so we don't have um, light walls bouncing light all over. It's kind of easier to do lighting in a dark room than, than a light room. Yes. And there's a carpeted floor and there's those, what are those tiles called? Acoustic tiles? Acoustic tiles, yeah, acoustic it's panels. Standard issue office tiles, which you know, you normally, um, I look up and go, oh, they're so ugly. But in a studio environment, I'm like, yes, I love you, acoustic tiles, because they really absorb sound nicely. Yeah, and you guys can't see the acoustic tiles in, in this shot of me as an example, because those are completely out of frame. Their only purpose is literally to absorb sound. The other thing to yes. be mindful of is you can see up in that photo that I have that uh, shotgun microphone that's actually pointed at me or that would be pointed at me uh, under normal circumstances. And of course, there are some lights as well that you'll notice on the ceiling. These are the standard office lights, and we actually don't use them at all. All of this is just simply the freestanding LED lights, uh, floodlight accent lights that we have within the studio. So mm -hmm. just because it and exists fact doesn't mean you want to use it. Yeah, we even got rid of the shotgun mic too, actually. We used to use it all the time, but then we found people would move off of it like this and you couldn't hear it so well. Right. So I'm using it today just uh, for simplicity's sake, um, but I'm also not moving around and I'm not necessarily stepping off frame and going to be having to change any sort of orientation in terms of where my audio source is going. You're a pro, Matt. I get it. You're a pro. We can trust you not to move around too much and not have people do things outside your house. This, uh, this other okay, shot here is, uh, is actually our, our original demo studio. So when we're giving uh, Pearl demonstrations uh, and product demonstrations, uh, we had our three-point lighting set up. Uh, we had some acoustic tiles on the wall, and we had a plain, simple, single-colored background uh, just to provide those demos and the demonstration. You also notice that we had a monitor that was sitting on top of a desk, uh, desktop tower that just provided us with a reference monitor to see all of our slide presentations as we were providing that content uh, to anybody of interest on camera. So the camera a little bit further back that was at about, about eye level, and periodically you would see us maybe just look down briefly to um, just reference the notes. So in this case for the studio today, my reference monitor is off to my left. So it periodically you'll see me turn to the left just to make sure that I'm seeing the content on the screen. 
Nice. So we have some final tips, right? Yep. And these are pretty, I mean, you guys have probably already thought of them, and they're, but they're probably still good to have, is think about your cable control, your cable management. Uh, you're not going to want to have this nest of wires that are wrapped up and all over the floor. You need to think about, A, your personal safety first, and B, making sure that you're not going to damage any of that equipment. So being able to put them uh, in a position or in a place that people aren't going to trip over them, they're not going to damage them or accidentally disconnect them from the video sources is pretty basic but pretty important. Another option might be um, security, right? If mm -hmm. this isn't in your personal home, you're going to want to have a way to lock up that gear so the people don't run off with the camera or the microphone or the TV. <laughs> so maybe you'll need a padlock or, or like some sort of uh, lock and key system that's in place, or maybe it's going to be a key card system in place with a backup key if you lose power. And um, mm -hmm. ooh, some, some signage. Signage is always important, especially if it's a shared space. So, yes, we've learned that again the hard way. Um, if you have, well, you know, it's kind of nice actually. People want to come into the studio, that's a good thing, yeah. but uh, they need to know when you're on air. Yeah, if you have, a, if you have an on air light, great. Uh, I have some sort of uh, directed tally light or something that will just turn red to let you know that the studio is in use. Uh, as an alternative, you know, just have an open or closed sign that you can put on the door that you can flip back and forth so people are able to understand very plainly and very clearly, oh, I can't walk in here right now. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a wrap on our presentation So for today. Uh, we're here to answer any of your questions that you might have about your streaming setup. I know there's a poll that went out asking you where you're setting up a stream, and it seems some of you are doing it in a classroom environment or a school environment, and some of you are doing it at home. So if you want specific uh, things answered, we're here to answer your questions. Um, so Matt, there's a couple of questions right off the top. Okay. Um, um, how are we doing the polling for this? So the polls are done uh, through Crowdcast. This is our, that's right. our specific yeah. platform that we're doing all of our streaming. Mm -hmm. And then we have another one asking us, what microphone do you recommend? That's from, from William. Okay. Um, so we'll expand on the Crowdcast thing just a little more for polling. Uh, so we're lucky enough here that at least when we're doing our webcasting events, uh, any sort of our live streaming events, is we have producers on hand like Cameron um, who who you may have seen once or twice before, he's appeared on our live show, uh, that manages and runs most of the show to do the layout switching and such. And we also have a team uh, like Michael, we have Adam, uh, and a number of other cast members who will prepare these, poll, these polls and this information for us and load them into Crowdcast or the specific system to then just publish and provide and make available to you guys as soon as, it's, uh, as it needs to be sent out. So uh, it depends on the platform, it depends on what you're using. Uh, but then we have things like uh, using NDI to do titling, right, to provide uh, more dynamic content directly on the screen. Uh, right. To William, so, in terms of your, uh, your audio question, um, the microphone, it really comes down to what your personal preference is. There are microphones out there that are in the thousands to tens of thousands of dollars range. And it's certainly that's, that's above and beyond. It's not something that you would necessarily need but you're gonna want something that's going to be reliable, that's going to have a good uh, frequency range and that you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you're not gonna spend a fortune on. Uh, I did mention before making sure that you have control over your sound and personally uh, in any sort of environment, George and I are kind of both in agreement on this that having something like a wireless lapel microphone or even just a wired lapel microphone to keep that microphone close to your audio source is the most important thing. Um, it's also gonna be the most reliable. As an example, I'm going to keep talking, but move further away from the shotgun mic, and you're going to notice that the audio quality starts to change. So whether I'm moving in frame or not, you're going to start to see you know, a change in that overall audio quality. So if you've got someone wearing a lapel microphone, and especially someone who likes to walk around the room, um, they're going to be able to have that same consistent audio through and through. And lapel microphones don't have to be expensive. You don't have to set an exorbitant, uh, exorbitant budget. It doesn't have to be thousands of dollars worth of, of audio equipment. It can be just reliable, stable, you know, road uh, Sennheiser uh, type wireless microphones. But again, it, it also comes down to personal taste and preference and what you're comfortable using. Mm -hmm. So, Matt, uh, I want to let everybody at home know mm -hmm. 
that if they want to learn about the Perl systems, there's a button below the, the Crowdcast uh, window that talks about that will link off to our Perl page. So if you want to find out how we recommend doing uh, building Electric Catcher Studio, check out our Perl systems. Um, I also want to let you know that we're going to be talking about streaming protocols uh, over the next couple of weeks. So we have recently added SRT as a streaming protocol, which is why you and I look so good today, Matt, right? That's absolutely yeah. Um, and we're going to be talking about that tomorrow on our live show. We're, so we're, we broadcast every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time uh, on Facebook and YouTube. Tomorrow we're talking about streaming protocols. No, we're talking about uh, bringing in a remote guest over SRT. Ooh, very cool. Because technically, we also have a no remote guest. We're, do, we're going to be talking about how we're doing this today, actually. Perfect. So you're, you're bang on there. And then uh, in another week, next week on the 24th, we're going to have a, another webinar about streaming protocols in general. We're going to talk about HLS and Dash so if, and SRT. So if you have questions about how all these streaming protocols work or how they can work for you, uh, be sure to sign up on our website. And again, if you are just checking out a webinar for the first time here, or if you haven't really checked out our live show before, visit our YouTube page. We've got uh, lots of content there, past webinars, past live shows, how-to videos, quick start videos, um, general content that we've we've run and displayed and done over time, and even some information about the, I believe Thomas Moore uh, information is up there as well when we did your, uh, your use case piece. Is that correct? Uh, that's not up there yet, but it will be soon. Okay, soon. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so that's pretty much it for us today here, Matt. This is a uh, we're one minute past three o'clock, so bad. we're a tidy hour today. Uh, if you guys do have so questions always... after the fact, um, do feel free to reach out to us either our live chat on our website. Um, so obviously you can do our, our live chat on our website. You can do our info at epifan.com to reach us in technical support and the rest of the sales and marketing team. Um, you can see all of our blog content, uh, webinar content, and past video content available, so we do recommend to check all of that out there. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, George. And thank you so much for joining and us. Thanks, today. everybody. Yeah. Okay. See you.